Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Turner Bitten. I'm the executive director here at Westview Media. We are going to get started here shortly. Um, I'd like to let the audience know that this event is being live streamed here on Facebook and recorded. So a recording will be available afterward. We are joined today by Tom Miller here from the Salt Lake City Transportation Division. Um, the event is, uh, the way that this works is you can submit questions and we'd invite the audience to submit questions here on the live stream. As the questions come in, I will collect them and I will put them in a queue that I will then ask Tom after he finishes his short presentation. So Tom, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, go ahead and turn your mic on and your camera on. Hey, everybody. Then if you would go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, we'll go ahead and get started with your presentation. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Millar. I work for, like Turner said, the Salt Lake City Transportation Division. So we're in charge as a division of designing streets, uh, doing outreach, making plans for the future for what our streets should look like. And, uh, and then anything after the street is built, maintaining the street, et cetera, is done by our, our fellow divisions in the Public Services Department. So we're really happy to be here today to talk to you about the Typologies Design Guide. So Turner, do you want me to share my screen now? Yeah, go ahead and get going on your presentation. Great, thanks. All right. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the Salt Lake City Street and Intersection Typologies Design Guide. Now that's a mouthful. Uh, sometimes we call it the Typologies Project, the design guide, just the typologies. And, uh, and we're gonna explain a little bit about what typologies are today. Basically, they are types of streets or kinds of streets. And traditionally in Salt Lake City, we've really only had about three, four kinds of streets. And, and we kind of apply them in, in different places, regardless of uh, what kind of housing or businesses or industrial uses are there. So what the Typologies Project is going to do is it's going to create 15 new kinds of streets that are much more context sensitive or much more tailored to the places that they're in. So before we get started, I, I want you guys, everybody on the live stream today to uh, think in your mind, uh, you can close your eyes if you want to, think of the best street that you've ever been on. Think about what it has Think, think about how you feel when you're on that street. Uh, what do you hear? Is it warm? Is it cold? Uh, is it shady? Is it sunny? Um, and, and think about that for, for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. We're going to have some silence for a second. Okay, Turner, I'm gonna ask you that question. What's, what's the best street you've ever been on and, and why is it the best street? Well, I'm a bit of a street nerd, but I, I think the first thing that came to mind uh, a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to travel to New Orleans um, and we stayed in an Airbnb in an area called the Garden District. And the street that sticks out in my mind uh, is the street that our, our Airbnb sat on because it was this big, beautiful, tree-lined street and it had a trolley that ran through it so mm. we felt like the entire time we were in new orleans uh that we lived in the city we only rode the trolley we were able to walk everywhere um and, and i'll i'll never forget how much i loved that that part of the city and particularly the street that we were on yeah thank you that's that's wonderful uh streets are really the lifeblood of our communities high quality, equitable, safe communities all have one thing in common, and that's good streets. And, and so what we're gonna talk about today is how we can make our streets in Salt Lake City even better. Um, research shows actually that uh, our streets in our, in our minds and kind of how we feel, our emotions, our streets are much like our, our living rooms. Um, we, we look at them all the time, we look at our windows, we look at our street, we pull in and out of the driveway, we go for walks. We're, we're almost as familiar with the street as we are our houses. And so any changes to streets um, is like somebody coming in and saying, oh, you know, you don't need that couch. You don't need that TV. We're gonna, we're gonna give you a new one. We're gonna redesign your, your living room. Um, and sometimes that's 
that's very, uh, it's very alarming. So today we're gonna talk about uh, these proposed changes to our street design and, and what it means now, what it means in the future, how you can provide your comments and how we can, uh, as a city, serve you best and make sure that the streets are as reflective of who you are uh, as you want them to be. So a little bit about streets. Turner said he was a street nerd. I'm a street nerd too. Uh, streets make up about 80% of all public space in our cities. That's, that's parks, government buildings, libraries, plazas, streets. 80% of all of that space that's not private is dedicated to streets. So more than anything else, our streets define who we are as a community. But traditionally, our streets have pretty much been focused on one thing, and that is moving our cars and storing our cars. Uh, providing some trees and providing some sidewalks. They're all great things, uh, but we know that our streets can do much more and they can reflect better how we live our lives right now than perhaps when they were designed and when they were built 20, 40, 100 years ago, 150 years ago in some cases, so that our streets are better reflective of, of how we live our lives today. Now, this is a street in Fair Park. This is 1200 West. Uh, just south of 600 North. Now this street, if you look to the right of where this image was taken, is just a residential street. It just has homes along it, your, your average Fair Park home. Um, but the street is exceptionally wide. Now, when streets are too wide, uh, as some of our streets in Salt Lake City are, they're a tremendous liability for us as taxpayers. I also live in Salt Lake City and, and pay my taxes in Salt Lake City. And I know that what goes into maintaining this street is, is a lot of money and, and not necessarily uh, money well spent as we see that only a, a very small portion of this street is actually used for its intended purpose. And as we build more streets or as the city grew uh, decades and decades ago and we built more streets that increased and increased and increased the liability to the city and, and how much we spend on maintaining our streets in the future. Now, streets that are too wide or too fast are also unsafe. They require not only uh, the societal and the personal cost of crashes uh, and, and whatnot, but they also require additional expenses to make the street even a little bit safer. Uh, but we can do a lot better. We can design the street, the width of the street, the speed of the street, the materials on the street, the shade of the street to be more inherently safe rather than just asking people to drive the right speed. People will feel naturally like they should drive the right speed. Now, when I say that our streets are too wide, uh, I don't want you to think that the Typologies project will be making them too narrow either. We want them to be just the right size depending on where they are, right? Depending on whether they're in front of a home or in front of a business or in front of both or in our downtown or in, or in an industrial area. And so we're gonna talk about what the Typologies Project does. Now it's interesting too that 1200 West just south of 600 North and 1200 West just north of 600 North look dramatically different. Even though they have the same kinds of homes, they have the same amount of car traffic on them, they, they're much, much, uh, one is much wider than the other. Uh, and, and this is because Different areas of the city developed at different times with different standards, different private developers developed them. And, and so they kind of reflect what our, um, what our values were at the time. But we wanna make sure that our streets are the right size for the right context and that we don't have all of this uh, varying width and varying design depending on when it was built. So what else is the Typologies Project? going to do. It's going to fix these problems and more. Um, basically, it will design better streets, better streets that are the right size for the right places. And, and I don't think that I exaggerate when I say that this guide, this design guide is perhaps maybe the most important transportation design project that we've done in the last maybe 20 years. Um, it will help our streets get back to their traditional uses to promote local quality of life, uh, commercial success, social structure, so that our streets aren't dividing us. They're doing the opposite. They're, they're, they should be uniting us. Uh, safe, well-designed streets 
are one of the wisest and, and I think one of the most conservative choices that we can make to make our communities healthier and safer. And, um, and so this project is, is, is gonna do just that. Now I mentioned earlier that it, uh, it, it has to be in the right place, the right street for the right place. Now what does that mean? Um, every property has a zone to it, right? You live in a residential zone or you live in a commercial zone or a mixed use zone. We have many, many zones in the city. But in the past, we've only had three kinds of streets, three or four kinds of streets. So by making more kinds of streets, we're able to better reflect what kind of zone that street is going through. Um, for example, 1200 West that we just talked about. That should probably look the same because it goes through the same kind of zone. Uh, but it shouldn't look the same as a street in another area that has much different uses like tall skyscrapers or, or warehouses. So this is kind of the ultimate in combining our zoning and our transportation, because it takes both into account and makes sure that they are both uh, accommodated in the design of our streets. Now, this also means that uh, the design guide is not going to dictate when, you're, when streets are gonna change or how they're gonna look um, in the end. We're still gonna follow that same process as, we, as any street comes up for reconstruction. This is just gonna provide us a, a better baseline for our future discussions so that we can create the streets that you want in front of your home. So this is kind of a preview of one of those 15 new types of streets, uh, a typology, a type, a kind of street. And, and again, this is a design guide. It's not a master plan. It's not a budget. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't provide any money for rebuilding or redesigning streets. It's really just guidance not only for us as planners of the city, but for you as neighbors, so that you can know if and when the opportunity comes up, what that street might look like in the future. And again, there are 15 of these, 15. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we got to these 15. So we knew that streets needed to do more than just move motor vehicles and park motor vehicles, which is that gray vehicle mobility purpose there on the right. We knew that there were basically five purposes that we could boil all of the purposes down into. And that is person mobility, walking or biking, greening, adding trees, adding landscaping, place making, making sure that we had a street that we could recognize that was, was a, a unique noticeable street. Curbside uses is anything that happens alongside the curb, like a bus stop, or a parking space, or even a bike rack. We knew that every street needed to include all five of these purposes so that our streets were doing more with the same amount of space. Now, some typologies prioritize uh, some of these functions or purposes over others, but all five are included in all 15 of the street types. Now, like I said, the right street for the right place. So we boiled our very complicated, complex zoning down into five unique different types of places. A destination district is like a downtown, could be our central business district or sugar house downtown. An urban village is something like um, ninth and ninth west or even ninth west and eighth south, where there are businesses, there are homes, uh, maybe even uh, taller homes, apartments. Uh, and, and people are in maybe greater densities than they are in other parts of the city. Ninth and Ninth could be a, a good example of this, maybe even 1300 East near the university. An industrial or a business park is almost everything west of Redwood Road, south of I-80, a uh, research park by the University of Utah, the International Center, this would fall under that kind of place type. The fourth is neighborhood. Neighborhood is the most common in the whole city. And, and the neighborhood node is like your corner market where you might go to get a coffee or buy some groceries or get your hair done if that kind of place exists in your neighborhood. And we knew that each of these different kinds of places had different needs, not only needs on the outside of the street, but needs within the street too. They move different amounts of traffic, people behave differently, uh, people need different things in different places, right? In front of my home, I need maybe some parking, 
I need a quiet street. But when I go to my office or when I go shopping, I need different things. And, and so we want to make sure that our streets are doing those different things depending on the place that they're in. So then we've taken these 15 new typologies based on their function and based on their place, and we've applied them to every street in the city. So every street has one of the 15 typologies applied to it. And you can go in and see what these uh, typologies look like, where we've applied them, and provide your comments. By no means is this said and done. This is not the city coming in and saying, this is what we're going to do, no matter what. Uh, we want your input so that we know that we're designing the right street for the right place. Now in the future, like I mentioned earlier, this is just going to provide a better starting point for discussions. We're still going to hold all the public meetings that we normally would if a street is rebuilt or redesigned. Um, and it doesn't change your street immediately. It's not like next year, if this, if this design guide is adopted by the city council, that your street is gonna change magically. Um, it's only if and when a project would be happening anyway on your street. And I'm gonna repeat some of these principles throughout the presentation. So what else is the typologies design guide going to do? It does a lot. Um, it's going to begin the process and has begun the process of updating an ordinance or a law that the city has called the Complete Streets Ordinance. Now the Complete Streets Ordinance basically tells us we need to look at every street and make sure that every type of transportation is incorporated. Walking, bicycling, transit, motor vehicle use, and any other types of transportation but it has some gaps and it has some holes in it. And as we've been working on it for the last 10 years, working with it, we, we've noticed where those are. So we've asked our, our consultants on this project, we've asked other cities how they have done their complete streets ordinance and gotten a lot of good feedback so that we can begin to update ours to make it stronger and better. And then it'll give us a unified vision so that the city and the community together uh, have this this better baseline, better foundation to, to talk about our streets and the streets that we want. Streets that are more livable, streets that are safer, streets that are shadier, streets that are much nicer to be on, to live on, to shop on, to drive on, to walk on, etc. And then I'm going to tell you how we got to where we got. So way back in January of 2019, we met with every department in the city and, and all of the applicable divisions that have any effect on streets. Could be the pipes underneath the street, the lights above the street, the street itself, the sidewalks, the trees. And we asked them a couple basic questions. How do you work with the street and how does the street affect your work? And their priorities and their grievances and their ideas formed uh, how we could approach this project, this typologies design guide. Then, like I said, we got some guidance on how to update our ordinance. We came up with these five place types that I mentioned earlier, and we came up with the five functions, and we prioritized those because we knew that some were more important in certain areas than, than in others. Again, those five functions. These came from, uh, from what people had told us for years and years and years that they wanted their streets to do better. And then I'll tell you a little bit about survey data that we got last year. We looked at our transportation and other master plans to tell us not only where, but what should it be happening in those streets, like the pedestrian and bicycle master plan from 2015, the transit master plan from 2017, Plan Salt Lake, community master plans like the West Side master plan, our zoning ordinance that I mentioned earlier, even UDOT plans, other regional plans, so that we weren't ignoring what we had heard and what we had done in the past as a community and as a city. And then uh, we developed some performance measures. So performance measures basically tell you, is the street working how you wanted it to work? And, and we have them broken out by those five functions. So we have different ways of, of tracking if a street is successful or not. How much of the overall space is dedicated to green space? How many people are walking and biking? How long does it take them to walk and bike? How safe do they feel? Things like that. We looked at some critical dimensions too. 
like how wide should the gutter be? Uh, what types of trees should we have? So that we were including those in our designs and we didn't have to rethink it uh, after the fact. And we've been working with UDOT because it's not just city streets that we travel on and live on. In Salt Lake City, we have many, many other types of streets in the city and they have been wonderful partners, equal partners in this process so that we have a unified approach in how we approach and how we deal with our streets, design our streets and maintain our streets. I did mention earlier that we did a survey last year. There were 1200 responses and this is what people told us. They told us that no matter where throughout their daily life, no matter their, their age or their income or their transportation choices, everybody told us that person mobility, walking, biking, using wheelchairs, is the most important function of our streets, followed by greening, followed by placemaking, then curbside uses, and then vehicle mobility. Now, vehicle mobility being last does not mean that it won't be included. No, that, that's not what it means at all. It just means that when we design a street and we look at these typology designs, we know where we need to put our priorities first. And when push comes to shove, the, the higher priorities, the things that people in Salt Lake City prioritize most uh, will, will likely win out. And then this was true regardless, again, of where people told us that they were responding from, whether it was from near their home, near their work, near schools and parks, or near shopping. It still followed this same trend. And you can see more uh, detailed results from that survey that occurred last year on the webpage. And that webpage is there at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so all of these things together, put them in the trash compactor and what came out? These 15 typologies that I mentioned earlier. And now I'm gonna run through real quick some examples of these 15. I'm gonna just show you a couple and then invite you to look at the rest of them online. So here is a, a typical typology. It has a, a name, a description, and an info table on the side. Now that info table has a couple of things. Tells you the typical width of a street where this typology might be applied. It tells you the different things that might go into that typology design, like a travel lane or a bus or sidewalks or parking or bike lanes and how wide they should be. It also talks about some planning and zoning information like how tall and how far away from the street should the buildings be. Uh, and then it also gets into a, a very interesting concept that I hope I can kind of drive home today, and that is the concept of target speed or design speed. This is not speed limit. Speed limit says what the maximum speed on a street should be, but often we don't design our streets for the number that is on that speed limit sign. What the Typologies Project is going to do is design the street to a certain speed, and then have the speed limit sign be that same speed. So that if you want your neighborhood street to be a slower speed, we wouldn't just put a sign up, we would design it in such a way that people would drive slower and it would be a, a nicer street. And then lastly, those five functions that we talked about before, the critical functions that are in all of the typologies, we have those with different priorities depending on where that typology has been applied. And then we have this design right next to it. So the design and the table talk to each other. What, what it says on the table is what's reflected in the design. Here's a little closer look at a, like a section view of that street and then a bird's eye view from up top. And you'll see this on each of the typologies. Now this is a street, the Urban Village Main Street is what it's called, that could be like 900 South, uh, through 9th and 9th, or maybe Indiana Avenue in the future, where you have homes uh, next to grocery stores, next to markets, next to parks. It, it has to serve multiple functions. And this is what it may look like. This is just an example from a town in Oregon. Um, here's another example of a bigger street, like a, like a UDOT street, maybe a Redwood Road or 400 South and downtown. This is maybe an example of what that might look like. It still has to move some traffic because it's a major road, <clears throat> but it's a much calmer, much nicer experience. This is maybe the smallest street that we have. This is called a commercial shared street 
where people can shop and walk and bike and eat and drive all in the same space, all between these, uh, these buildings that are fairly close to each other. And then a neighborhood corridor. And this is the last one that I will uh, emphasize. We, we would invite you to see the rest of them online. Uh, this is like, you know, the main street that goes through your neighborhood. Could be like 1700 South in Liberty Wells area, or maybe even parts of 600 North, uh, parts of 300 North. This is what we would like them to look like in the future. We know that all of those streets right now uh, have much different needs in different contexts and right now different designs, uh, but we wanna make sure that they are uh, the right size for the right place. This is an example of what that might look like. A narrower street, still a street that allows cars to pass each other and a lot of cars to come uh, to and fro, but, but a, a space for everybody and, and well-designed and, and well-manicured. So we're gonna invite you to review a few things online. These 15 street typologies or kinds of streets, go through each one of them if you'd like to, or just choose the ones that are near your house or near the places that you, that you frequent often. Take a look at them and then below every single typology there is a survey and you can tell us whether you like the design or whether you don't what you like about it, what you don't like about it, what you wish that we would change about it. And then look at the map. This is a preview of what that map looks like. Zoom into where your house is, where your work is, where your favorite park is, favorite restaurant, and see what type of typology or street type has been assigned to those streets in that area. When you click on it, it will give you, again, that information that you saw in the table. It will also give you a link that will take you to the typology design so that you can get at it multiple ways. On the web page itself, by clicking the link of the typology name or by clicking on a street that is assigned to that typology and then following the link in there. And again, surveys at the bottom of all of these pages so that you can express your thoughts and tell us what you think about these ideas. Now, it's July 30th right now, August 15th is when we would love your comments by. That's in two weeks, a little bit over two weeks. Um, after that, we will work on incorporating all of your comments into the typologies. We will uh, come up with a, a much better version, I think, if we're incorporating your, your feedback. And then we will present that version to the city council. So when the city council hears it, there will be another round or opportunity for input. And we would love your input at that time as well. So again, here's the website, big bold letters, and here's that timeline. Review right now, provide your comments by August 15th, and then in the fall, we will be uh, presenting that, that final plan to the council, and we would love your additional input at that time as well. So to conclude, uh, streets should be safe for everybody, and they should be for everybody. Uh, regardless of where you are throughout your day, you should feel safe. You should feel like you're getting to where you need to go um, efficiently and safely and, and that you enjoy the places that you live and that you work and that you recreate in. Uh, the design guide is going to be just that, guidance. It will help us to make uh, better progress, have better conversations, and to reflect the needs that you have in your communities and on your street. And so we hope that you'll take the time to provide your feedback and to let us know what you think, and we look forward to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, if you would go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Sure, yeah, I can do that. We'll put it back up before we end uh, so that your contact information is available. Okay, that sounds good. So far, we've had eight questions come in, um, and I apologize Wonderful. that I'm looking between screens. Uh, That's okay. The first one is, how did you define a street? What was the threshold um, for a street to be included in this process? Yeah, a street is any public street in Salt Lake City. So some of the streets that we left out are all of our private streets, uh, most of our airport streets, uh, streets within parks, because those are very unique and need to be uh, different depending on what park you're in. So all told, there were about 8,400 street segments and each one of those segments was assigned one of those typologies. Great, thank you. 
Um, the next question was, uh, how does the design of a street impact the target speed of a street? Yes. There are a lot of things that affect the, the, the target speed of a street. Think about when you're driving down uh, I-15 or I-80. If there wasn't a speed limit sign on the side of the road, how fast would you drive? Would you drive the speed limit, 70? Would you drive 90? Would you drive 100? Because the freeway is designed to move cars and not to slow cars down, there's not a lot of things on the side of the freeway, other than billboards, I guess, to, to slow you down. The curves are very gentle. Uh, you don't have to go down steep hills or up steep hills on the freeway, typically. And, and all of those things contribute to a high target speed. Now, we kind of want to do the opposite in our city because our city is supposed to be where we slow down, where we live, where we work, and where we shop. And so we kind of do the opposite. We introduce things to the street that not only make it nicer to be on, but also slower to drive on, like trees, like the width of the street. Even parking can help to lower the target speed of a street. Um, and, and so we'll incorporate more of those things, more trees, bigger trees, better trees, wider sidewalks, narrower streets, uh, so that we can achieve those target speeds that we would like to achieve. And, and I will mention that the, in these draft uh, proposed materials, the fastest target speed that we have in the city is about 30 or 35 miles per hour. So that'll be the, the absolute limit. That's as fast as anybody if all of these typologies were built, which, which they, they probably won't be for a very, very long time, uh, that's the fastest that anybody would be driving in Salt Lake City. Great. Um, we just got another question. I'm going to send it to you in the chat so you have a chance okay. to read it. Great. Uh, and then I'm going to respond just really quickly to a couple of questions that we've received. Um, Dave, I just sent your question to Tom. I'm going to give him just a second uh, to review it since it's very specific. Yeah. Amy and Misty and Victoria, I will get to yours just shortly. There's just a couple of questions ahead of yours, but I'll get right to them. Great. Okay, so there is a question about a street in Salt Lake City. Let me, I'm going to bring it up on, on Street View so that I can tell exactly where we're looking at. Near about 1300 South and, and State Street. Not exactly there. I, I don't want to give away the, the location of this person's home. Um, but we're talking about a street that's fairly narrow. I, I believe that, that they said that the street is, is about um, 23 feet wide. Uh -huh. um, now, not everything that's in all of the typologies will fit on every street because we know that, especially our residential streets, have a lot of variants. Some are, some are really wide, some are really narrow. And that's, that's why we have those priorities, those five functions of the street, of the right-of-way, so that if we don't have enough space, we know the things that are of lesser importance, the things that might be taken out of the design so that we can fit what is most important into the street when it's constrained. Now, the other way, if the street's too wide, and the typology doesn't fill all of the space that we, that we potentially have, then we would also use those priorities of those five functions to add more space first to the things that are most important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the, the next question I'm going to go to is, uh, can you explain what a complete, what complete streets is? Yes. Complete streets basically is that every street should work for everybody. And that is everybody regardless of their ability, regardless of their age, regardless of what transportation options they choose. So whether they're on a train or in a car or on the bus or on their bike or walking or in a wheelchair, they should feel just as safe on, on any street uh, regardless of, their, of, of that choice or, or the time of day or, or any, any other factors. So what the Complete Streets Ordinance means is that when the city redesigns a street, we try to the best of our ability to design it for that goal, that everybody feels safe and comfortable no matter what circumstance they find themselves in. Right. Um, there's a couple of questions here and I'm gonna 
kind of merge them into one question. Sure. Uh, they're all in kind of a similar vein, but what neighborhoods were included in the survey? And then can you kind of give a breakdown of the survey responses? And uh, the, the question here is that a thousand responses is approximately half of 1% of the folks that live in Salt Lake. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. You know, we didn't get 200,000 responses to the survey. And, and very often we don't. Um, 1,200 to 2,000, a, a few thousand is typically our response to surveys. Now we had it open for about two months and, and we tried to get it out to as many people as possible. But obviously we didn't get it out to everybody or else we would have 200,000 responses. Um, the, the neighborhoods that we, that we promoted it to, every neighborhood, every community council, uh, every possible organization that we could get it out to, we sent it there, we sent it through the city's um, feedback community as well as our social media channels and other email. Uh, we tried to get as broad of a reach as we possibly could. And then what we saw in terms of representation after the fact was that every neighborhood was represented uh, almost equally in terms of the responses per capita. Or if there were 10,000 people in your neighborhood and 20,000 people in this neighborhood, the other neighborhood would have twice as many responses, but still be representative. The one exception to that, however, is Glendale. We had a, a slightly lower response in Glendale than we did in other neighborhoods. And you can see that in the map that is provided on the survey response summary that's at the bottom of the project website. It's in the bottom left side of that graphic summary. So you'll see that there. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I have some work to do because I'm the Glendale Community Council Chair, so we got to get surveys in <laughs> well, there. Well, yeah, let's let's flip the script, right? Let's get Glendale the most responsive to the to the surveys that are open right now. That would be great. For sure. Um, so the next the next question, um, I guess it's not as much of a question uh, as much as a statement, but from my understanding, the public comment period is still open right now. What absolutely. Kind of what kind of questions are you, you learning about or, or are you looking for from folks right now? What kind of feedback would you like them to provide you? Honestly, anything. Um, I, we've heard a couple common themes as people have emailed us questions and as we reviewed just a couple of the responses that have come in so far, um, a lot of them boiled down to how is this going to impact me and how is it going to change what the street in front of my house looks like. And, and what I've responded to, to those people who've asked, and what I'll say now is that if the design guide, the typologies design guide is adopted by the city council, immediately it doesn't change anything. Um, all it does is provides a better, uh, it provides better guidance for decision makers, for the public and for planners and designers like myself when a project does come up, if a project comes up on your street to be redesigned or reconstructed in order to have a better starting point for those conversations that will still proceed. Um, another question that I've gotten is, is this a 10 year plan? Is this a 20 year plan? You know, what kind of horizon or what kind of deadline does this, does this plan have? When can we expect it to be done? And, and, I, I, I think the simple answer is there is none uh, because it takes decades and maybe even hundreds of years for every street to be redesigned and reconstructed. And, and we don't, um, we, we know that this is not going to be a, a fast process and something that's going to happen within our, you know, our careers at the city or, or our lifetimes perhaps, but but it does provide that vision, that design guidance, that foundation uh, for how we can have those conversations in the future. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of other questions. I'm gonna hurry and combine them really quickly. Sure. Um, you mentioned earlier the kind of ecosystem of how you all worked with the other departments at the city to bring th this typologies guide in line with the other plans. How does it intersect or how do you uh, imagine meshing those with one another after the, the typologies come out um, and looking specifically at the West Side Master Plan um, and the affordable housing overlay that has just come out? 
Yeah. The, the wonderful thing about this project is that it has, through the process of the project, nearly 18 months now, broken down a lot of walls that we didn't even realize were up and, and allowed us as a project team within the city and as a relationship between the city and the community to, to realize where we weren't talking to each other or where we weren't speaking the same language. So because the typologies design guide is based just foundationally on the zoning and, and the goals that are in the West Side Master Plan, in Plant Salt Lake, citywide goals and community-based goals, we know that it, it's, you know, they're not, they're not conflicting. They're not fighting against each other. They don't have competing interests. They're very much hand in glove now because we didn't just, as a transportation division, put our heads down, come up with some ideas and then come up for air and say, okay, planning division or okay, public services department, what do you think about these? It was a, a process that we all took together and made sure that everybody's input was included and not just transportation. Because for a long time, streets have been about transportation. And, and so it was kind of incumbent on us as the transportation division to say, okay, we're gonna take ourselves out of the driver's seat, no pun intended, and, and make sure that our streets are doing much more than just transportation and serving all of those functions that, that the rest of the city so desperately needs. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity. There, there's, it, it seems there's a little bit of confusion. Does this typologies guide mean that we're going to immediately start either expanding streets, resurfacing them, or changing them? Is this a, is this a, a plan as much as guardrails for future development? Mm. It, is, it is not a, it's not a master plan. It does not specify when projects should happen or where they should happen or how much budget they should, they should need. It is just a design guide. Uh, just like our zoning ordinance that says that a property could be something, doesn't make it that thing. Um, I live in a mixed use zone. I live in a single family residential house. Just because the zone is mixed use does not mean that my house has suddenly become uh, you know, a multifamily apartment complex. So the same, the same thing with the Typologies Project, it is really just, like you said, guardrails, guidance, things that will help us to, to make those decisions in the future, but by no means does it change or dictate when things will change immediately. Thank you. Uh, kind of along those lines, um, after the, the guide is published, what happens? Um, are, are residents still able to provide feedback when a street is resurfaced? Um, if things are being changed, what does the kind of decision making look like? And we had a specific question um, for how the the parking is decided for which side of the street. What it what oh, sure. it's kind of look like? Yes. So because this is only design guidance, what it will give us is a starting point for speaking with the community when a project does come up for redesign. Um, and and we will not skip any part of the process that we have done in the past when a project comes up and and in fact we'll probably make the the process um, even more um, interesting and more involving because there will be already a, a design to react to to build off of to to alter so that it fits the needs of that community um, about six months ago when we were starting to see these pieces of the typologies design guide come together, uh, there was a discussion in the city whether this would shorten our, our project timeline, whether it would shorten the amount of time that we have to engage the public or, or cut out public meetings or anything like that. And we determined that, that absolutely no, that this would still keep that wonderful process that we have of incorporating everybody's input, but all it would give us is not only a better starting point, but hopefully, and this is what we hope, a better final result. Uh, the process will still be there. The opportunities for input will still be there. The opportunities to, to alter the, the typology to fit those specific needs will still be there. And, and like I said before, we hope that the result will just be a better result. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next two questions uh, kind of deal with cost. So yeah. 
some of these typologies, it appears that a complete redo of streets is going to be required. Um, is there a budget for doing that? Um, and, and how does, you know, we already have a difficult time paying for redoing the streets that we have. With this vision, um, what does that process look like moving forward and, and how do you plan to do that? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. And I think it actually piggybacks really well on the last question and I hope to expand on that. The city after the typologies design guide is, is completed will begin on their transportation master plan. Now we haven't updated that in about 25 years, which is a long time. I mean, the last time it was, it was updated was before tracks um, a, a long time ago, pre-Olympics. Um, and that transportation master plan will deal with those questions of uh, phasing, budgeting, policy issues, how we're gonna fund this new vision for what our streets might look like. Now, it's absolutely correct that what is shown in the typologies is, is better, is, is more intense, more trees, more sidewalks, uh, more things that we don't currently have, and obviously those things cost money. Now we see this as transportation planners kind of from a, a, a much broader level in what we call the life cycle of our streets. So over the 50 or 75 years that a street is in place, not only how much did it cost to begin with, but how much are we spending on it to maintain it every year? And so we know, uh, based on our experience from the last 50, 75 years, that a, a wide street and a street without shade and a street without sidewalks is, is actually quite expensive to maintain. But if we add these things in that reduce the street width, reduce the amount of area that we have to maintain to that, that very highly engineered level of a street, then the less, um, the less costs we would have related to the street in the future. Now it would add potentially some costs to the things that are outside of the, the roadway per se, um, maintenance of the, of the park strip, of the trees, of some of the other elements that are there. And so some of those questions that we still have and that we have not answered yet uh, will hopefully be answered as we work on that transportation master plan over the next couple of years. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, uh, the next two questions uh, kind of run hand in hand. Um, so how do you project making sure that this matters, that the, the, mm -hmm. over, or that the uh, guide is actually followed? A uh, commenter here said, for example, the complete streets ordinance isn't always followed. Um, mm -hmm. So if this is just a guide and there's no timelines um, or process, then how do you make sure that this is utilized and doesn't just become another uh, yeah, I'll answer that question in two parts. The first is from the beginning, from the outset of this project, we have sought to include everybody within the city and most of those outside of the city that would be in charge of the, the building of or the maintaining of these types of streets. And, and so that we don't just do the project and then once it's done, we send it to them in an email and then they forget about it. This is something that, that has, I think, brought everybody sort of into the same realm uh, with the same vision. And, and then hopefully, because we've all had this experience together of going through the process, it helps us to work together better in the future. And so that, that'll be the, the first part of how I answer that question. The second part, although I consider myself a street nerd, I am by no means a perfect street nerd. And as the project manager of this project, I understand that this project is not going to be, it's not gonna be perfect. Um, just, just like our zoning ordinance, just like our other master plans, it will need to be updated. It will need to be changed because we change. The things that we need in our streets change. The buildings around us change. The zoning changes. And we need to make sure that, that we don't get too, too arrogant and say, uh, this thing's perfect and it's got to survive for a hundred years uh, by no means. This, this is still an open book and, and we want to update it as often as we need to so that it reflects what the community wants in their streets. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to respond really quickly. Stacy. I, I saw your question about how we can communicate better uh, with neighborhoods. 
Uh, this presentation is an example of one of the things that we're trying to do here at Westview Media uh, to help the city reach out better and do the kind of communication. I know Tom and the city is very committed to reaching out to as many folks as possible. And we're trying to do our part as a community organization to help get the word out. Um, I'd like to thank you, Tom, for coming on today. The questions have kind of died down a little bit. So I'm going to give you just five or so minutes to kind of wrap up, um, give us some final thoughts, and then I'd like to put up your contact information so sure. that the yeah. folks that have been watching, um, I know that I haven't answered every question and I've tried to combine them. If your question wasn't answered today, I know that Tom would be happy to answer it. Um, after his kind of final remarks, we'll put up his contact information and then end the live stream. But I, I encourage you to reach out to Tom if we haven't been able to answer all your questions today. Yeah, I, I think I'll conclude just by saying that these are your streets. And when we say public right of way, we mean public right of way. It's not city right of way, it's not Tom's right of way. Uh, and our streets should work for, for everybody that uses them. So I don't want you to take anything that I said today as gospel. If you disagree with it, that's wonderful. And, and that's what we wanna hear. We wanna hear what you think about these materials uh, because we, we have this uh, opportunity between now and the end of the year to incorporate your feedback and to make sure that this is as good as it can possibly be. Um, I, I think that this will be a major step forward, but by no means does it get us to the finish line. Uh, we still are committed to working together to make sure that our projects are uh, high quality and, and that they reflect the needs and the desires and the, the culture of, of the different communities and the, and the different neighborhoods in our city. So stay involved, make sure you tell us what you think, and, and then make sure that you, uh, that you keep a lookout for if a project is happening in your area or areas that are important to you, so that you can make sure that you, you provide your feedback and stay up to date on those projects. And again, if anything comes up, if you can't figure out the website, uh, if you, if you try putting your survey in and your internet dies and it, anything that happens, um, send me an email. Uh, you can contact me either through the website, my email's at the bottom, or I'll put my contact up, my contact information up. Um, and, and I'm an open book. I would love to help and love to answer any questions that you have. So thanks for your time. I know that that's a, that's a lot of time to give and, and we really appreciate it. So August 15th, we hope to hear your feedback by then and, and happy to continue to continue the conversations after that. And does your final slide include the link to the feedback? It does. Yep. Let me share it real quick. And uh, I just want to thank everyone who's tuned in today to the live stream. As we said, if we haven't answered your questions today, uh, please feel free to reach out to Tom. And then the, the URL there is how you can submit your public comment. So we appreciate your time. Um, and with that, we are going to end the live stream. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody.